everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, being here. Um, as Elias said, I'm Jasmine F. Dickery. I'm a senior uh, transit planner with TTC, uh, the service planning department. I'm very excited to be here. I did my undergrad at U of T, and it just like feels great to be back, like around all the like knowledge and like energy from students. So I'm super excited for our session. Um, and um, I'm gonna hopefully have some time at the end of my presentation for discussion, questions, and answers. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about uh, planning for transit service in um, a post-COVID world. So I will um, start by talking about our service and our transit system, the TTC system, at a very high level. So I'll talk about our network, um, some system-wide stats, and also um, what our ridership and our uh, on the travel patterns of our customers. Um, then I'll talk about our planning process. So again, this is going to be a high-level discussion of our board period planning process, which I'm uh, leading um, this year. Uh, and I'm also going to talk about factors and inputs that influence this process. So um, I'll talk about planning for customer demand um, and um, changes in our customer travel patterns. Um, then we'll talk about planning for technology and uh, modernization of our transit system. Uh, we'll also talk about planning for construction. So how do we plan for and change our service around uh, construction projects in the city? Um, and last but not least, I'll talk about uh, planning for future. So how is our service going to look like in the next couple of years and also um, over the next decade? And then at the end of it, there is going to be time for questions and answers. So our service and our um, transit system. This is a map of our transit system covering the city of Toronto and in some instances there are routes that uh, travel across the, the city boundaries to York region and uh, Peel. Uh, we are currently operating three modes, uh, bus, subway and streetcars uh, with light, uh, light rail transit coming in the new uh, near future. Um, our customers can use our um, transit system and connect to um, all of our neighboring transit agencies. They can connect to uh, Go Services, Go Train, Go Bus, and Up Express, and also they can connect to VRL. Um, just a fun fact, we celebrated our 100th uh, birthday uh, last year, uh, which is a huge milestone for us. So now we can say that the TCC is a century old, which is great. <laughs> Um, so bus routes, um, there are bus and streetcar routes. Uh, we currently have around 210 bus and streetcar routes across the system. Uh, we have a fleet of about 2,100 buses uh, with big changes coming to our fleet as we move towards electrification. Um, and I'll talk about that towards the end of my presentation. Uh, we also have four um, rapid transit lines with two LRT lines um, opening next year. So those are line uh, five Eglinton and line six Finch West. Um, and uh, line three Scarborough, which is shown in blue, is also going to be de decommissioned next year. Uh, we have a fleet of 876 subway cars. Um, and um, that includes our Toronto Rocket uh, trains, uh, which we have on line one and line four, and our T1 trains on line two. Uh, we also have 204 low, uh, 204 low floor streetcars, uh, and these are the streetcars that are fully accessible. So, uh, regional context, the TTC is the largest transit agency in the greater Toronto area. Um, before COVID, uh, we carried about 85% of all transit trips made in the region, um, and 11% of our riders live outside of Toronto. So the figures that I'm showing here, um, and also in the next couple of slides, are all from uh, before COVID. Um, so the, I guess, numbers and quantities have changed, obviously, but the magnitude is probably still the same. Um, so our uh, system ridership pre-COVID, again, uh, we um, served about 1.7 uh, million uh, trips daily and 521 uh, million trips annually. Uh, and we are obviously the third largest transit agency in North America after New York and Mexico City. So uh, what are our busiest bus routes or what were our busiest bus routes before COVID? 
Um, so 29 Dufferin, 36 Finch West, and 25 Don North were our busiest bus routes together, carrying more than 127,000 uh, lives per day. Um, so I was just like before coming to the session today, I was looking at um, the, uh, I guess, ranking uh, for October 2022. Um, and uh, 29 Dufferin is still on the top uh, top three, it's number two. Uh, now we have the Wilson Cat uh, Corridor and the Lawrence Corridor among the top uh, three. So um, there are some new routes appearing in the ranking, uh, but ridership hasn't uh, obviously stabilized yet. So this is going to change in the, the next uh, year probably. Our busiest streetcars pre-COVID were 504 King, 501 Queen, and 510 Spadina. Um, as of October 2022, 501 Queen is our uh, busiest uh, streetcar route. Busiest subway stations uh, in terms of, um, um, I guess, entries and exits. Um, Lauren Young, uh, uh, both the Line 1 and Line 2 uh, stations, uh, and also Union Station at Line 1. Um, so this graph shows our annual ridership uh, from 1995 to 2021 uh, in millions. Now, as you can see, uh, our ridership was steadily, gradually, but steadily increasing um, until 2019, and then COVID happened. And between 2019 and 2020, uh, we saw a decrease of ridership of about 45%. Um, going from uh, around 525 million trips um, in 2019 uh, to about 225 million trips. And that's the huge drop that you see towards the end of the graph. Uh, the graph. And um, our ridership is obviously recovering from that. So we're not back at the pre-COVID levels yet. Um, so on uh, bus, uh, we are at 75% of, of our pre-COVID ridership. Um, as of the last week of October, 62% uh, on subway and 55% on streetcar. Um, so all of our bus fleet, all of our buses, and half of our streetcar fleet is equipped with automated passenger counters, APC. Um, so we have access to fine-grained, detailed ridership data. And that's the data that you see in the, the graph. Um, and uh, the graph uh, shows the daily ridership on all of our bus routes. Uh, using the IPC data. So, uh, planning. Um, how do we plan for service um, at the TTC? What does the process look like? Uh, what are our standards and policies? So, we have two major objectives in uh, planning for transit service. One is to maximize mobility within the city of Toronto by ensuring that public transit is provided in the right places at the right times to satisfy um, the travel needs of the community. And two, uh, to ensure that all transit services operated by the TTC are as efficient and cost effective as possible and uh, accountable and affordable uh, for our TTC customers and also taxpayers. Um, in achieving these goals, uh, we must uh, strike a balance between benefits that are achieved uh, from providing transit services and the cost uh, that uh, we um, or our taxpayers incur to provide these services. Um, and that's um, where we use service standards. So service standards lay out a framework for achieving these goals. Um, these are the process by which we plan and evaluate our transit services, um, and they basically provide a formal mechanism for measuring trade-offs in an objective and equitable way. So, what are some of our service standards? Um, I have a couple of examples here. Um, this is by no means um, like all of the service standards that we use, these are some of the most commonly standards that we use. If you want to see the whole document, it's like a 40-page PDF that you can uh, find on our website. Um, so some of the, the examples of our commonly used service standards, one of them is coverage and access, uh, which is um, an important aspect of uh, providing um, the city and our customers with adequate access to transit. So we want to make sure that our customers are uh, close to and have access to transit service. Um, and uh, the coverage and access standard addresses the accessibility of transit by targeting a maximum walking distance um, for our customers uh, to reach a transit station or a stop, um, and that distance is 400 meters, 
um, span of service. Uh, we provide a transit service 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, and um, again, um, the span of service and service levels vary uh, for each transit service classification. So for our rapid transit bus and streetcar, um, it's different. Uh, we have a 30 minute frequency um, ceiling. So basically, um, that's the maximum uh, headway or a trans a com combined transit service can be on uh, each uh, specific corridor. Uh, and we also operate a network of 10 minutes for better routes. Um, and that's about 50 or so routes that operate at a 10 minute or better frequency. Uh, vehicle crowding. Um, so that's an average um, vehicle crowding, which sets the comfort of our passengers while on board the, our vehicles. Um, this standard determines the appropriate level of service based on the maximum low point um, or the greatest number of customers riding at one time in the busiest direction along the route during the busiest 60 minutes of each period of service. And service reliability. Um, so basically we know that if, uh, our customers or any person using any transportation mode has an expectation that the service will be reliable. Um, and um, the on-time performance of our, our routes is very important for us. And we also know that uh, the OTP is affected by many variables uh, including run times, uh, service levels, traffic congestions, traffic incidents, uh, construction related delays, uh, weather, and so on. Um, so the way we measure our on-time performance right now um, is uh, to be considered on time. Uh, our vehicles must uh, leave their origin time point, so depart from a terminal between one minute early and five minutes late. So if a vehicle depart the original uh, originating terminal within that time span, it's considered on time, and our goal is to have a 90% of all trips depart on time. So um, we know that transit planning is a continuous and iterative process. Uh, we want to be highly responsive to changing customer demands, uh, customer requests and complaints, and also operating conditions. Uh, we want to continue to review new ridership information, uh, construction information, service requests, and etc. Um, that's why we have 10 board periods in a year. So board periods are basically uh, where we set new schedules um, and we basically develop uh, driver's work assignments. Um, and uh, that's a lot of um, board periods. It's probably one of the highest in North America. Um, but uh, what it does is that it allows us to stay agile and flexible and to be able to respond to seasonal uh, travel pattern changes, to construction, um, and any, any unforeseeable um, changes to service. Uh, we currently have a team of six uh, transit planners uh, who work on these changes and we also work closely with our scheduling uh, counterparts uh, and other internal and external departments uh, to make sure that we have all the input and information we need uh, when we're making changes as part of these board field planning process. Um, and uh, there are also major challenges that we um, have been facing in the, the past uh, couple of years, especially um, since COVID. Um, so we have a high reliance on Fairbox um, revenue, uh, and that places a burden on, on our transit system because when ridership falls, then there is going to be a huge revenue shortfall that needs to be addressed through other means of, uh, or other uh, ways of investment. Um, we um, are facing near and long-term fiscal uncertainty, uh, partly because of that. Uh, our current funding framework has limited ability for service expansion and improvement, especially our operating budget and our operating costs. Um, and uh, we're also dealing with changes and uncertainty in travel behavior, um, mode share and travel demand in general um, because of COVID. Okay. So now that we got all the definitions and policies and all the standards uh, stuff out of the way, uh, let's talk about what the uh, board period planning process, our planning process actually looks like. Um, so as I said, we have access to really good APC data. So we know what our um, ridership is um, at the route stop 
um, level and also for a time of day. Uh, we can, using that data, we can account for seasonal variations. We can account for time of day and day of week variation. Also, we can account for, we're trying to account for change in uh, travel demand and travel patterns that we're observing. So this is an example of um, that data for um, one of our busiest routes, Route 35 James. So um, the bars show um, number of um, ons and offs or boardings and alightings um, at the route level throughout the day uh, by hour. Um, and uh, the gray bar shows fall 2019, so pre-COVID, and the orange uh, brown bars show uh, fall 2022, so that the most recent data we have access to. So as you can see, there's a lot of variation across, like throughout the day, starting from like the early morning, then peaking um, during AM peak, like reducing again, peaking again during PM peak, and then um, reducing towards the end of the day. Um, and you can also see the difference uh, between uh, pre-COVID and now. Um, our uh, ridership is less peaky, like the difference uh, between the peaks and middays are um, less um, smaller, less considerable, but we still have the peaks that uh, we need to uh, plan for. And um, one of the ways we use our climbing standards is uh, to respond to this demand. Uh, so we want to make sure when we look at our ridership and our customer demand using our pattern standard or how many people um, should be on our buses at any time, we want to make sure that we have enough service operating on all of our routes. So planning for modernization. Um, there have been technology changes uh, impacting our service. Um, and they're going to continue to do so as uh, we are modernizing in sis uh, our system in the, the next um, decade, in the next couple of years especially. Uh, one of the changes that we have been working on recently is uh, introduction of ATC, or Auto uh, Automatic Train Control, on Line 1. Um, so Line 1 is uh, operating with ATC right now. Uh, the implementation of ATC represents an important step forward in modernizing our subway system and it's essential to providing the best or uh, efficient uh, service for our customers. So there are two main, uh, three main advantages uh, to providing the ATC. Uh, one is increased reliability, so it gives us the capacity to safely run more trains uh, closer together, uh, which means that our service is more reliable um, it also means that we can improve our travel time. So because trains are running consistently and closer to each other, um, we can shorten our travel times and run train, um, more trains um, for the same amount of resources. Uh, and it also lowers our operating costs. Uh, train electricity usage will become much more efficient as a result of that. Um, I have a video that I want to show, but I don't know if it will work. So let me um, try and see. See, I actually have it open. Let's see if the sound works.
The change is officially taking effect this Sunday, but it's been a while that our line one has been fully operating with ATC. So next time you take a train on line one, use line one if like when you see that the trains are operating like really closely to each other and it's like super fast and there are no delays, hopefully, then you know that it's because of ATC. <laughs> everybody else yeah yeah like disruptive customers and all that yeah which we can't really control. I know. Yeah. or technology can control you know, beat up your passengers more yeah. <laughs> don't be bad um so another um i guess factor or input that impacts our service planning is construction so Planning for construction is a major part of our work. Um, it's basically, we need to determine how uh, we can change our service most effectively to accommodate city and TTC construction um, that often result in partial or sometimes full closures of, of roadways um, in the city. Um, there are a lot of construction projects impacting bus service, but buses are obviously more flexible than streetcars, so they can, um, do detours easily, they can go around construction, but our major challenge has always been uh, planning for um, streetcar detours when uh, construction happens because um, streetcars are bound and limited by the, the tracks and um, their detours are obviously gonna be less flexible and there's gonna be less, uh, fewer options for uh, streetcar detours. That's why I wanna show an example of a uh, streetcar uh, construction Detroit that we have been uh, working on since um, um, last year, I believe. So that's the uh, King Street West and Shaw Street uh, TTC track replacement, road surfacing, and water main replacement. Uh, so you can see uh, two pictures side by side. The, the one on the left is uh, before construction started, just at the same intersection. So when streetcars were operating, uh, easily without any disruptions and then the one on the right uh, shows the extent of the construction obviously streetcars can get through the intersection so we had to come up with um, detours um, so the construction itself is actually only 80 meters of the intersection uh, but because there was no access to the intersection for streetcars uh, we had to come up with a detour that uh, works operationally and also doesn't remove a lot of service or provides the same uh, amount of service for our customers. Uh, so we came up with a detour, a combination of detouring uh, streetcars and also uh, coming up with a bus replacement service that would cover, cover the gap. And uh, construction, fingers crossed, it's uh, planned to end uh, early December, so hopefully service can go back to on the 504 can go back to normal, normal soon. Um, in the past few months, we've also been working internally and with our uh, partners of the city uh, and also Metrolinks uh, to come up with a new approach for planning um, diversions, uh, streetcar and buses also uh, around construction in downtown. Uh, so we want to make sure that we create simple bus routings on uh, nearest parallel corridors. We want to make sure that we leverage the urban context where walking and cycling are alternatives, especially downtown. Uh, we want to stop chasing the schedules. We want to focus on the large scale stages rather than changing our schedules and our bus or streetcar routes like every, every board period or like even like every couple of weeks in some instances. Uh, we also want to work with our uh, city partners and other partners to move transit better on parallel routes that would address the capacity on a network perspective. 
Uh, making our transit system accessible is uh, another really important goal for us. Um, so uh, we know that accessible conventional services benefit everyone. Um, it allows more spontaneous trip making opportunities uh, for everyone, including people with disabilities, seniors, people with strollers, uh, with shopping carts. Um, our bus fleet is now fully accessible um, and our streetcar fleet is also fully accessible. Um, we're working on replacing and expanding our Wiltrans fleet. Um, that's an ongoing effort. Um, and also, uh, we have invested a lot um, on um, improving our infrastructure for accessibility, and that's our easier access program, uh, which is um, basically retrofitting our subway stations to make sure that all of them are accessible using, using elevators, mostly. Um, so this is an example of uh, one of the easier access uh, projects that is currently underway. It's at Donland Station on Line 2. It's uh, one that's uh, closer to my house. That's why I chose it. Um, so uh, the bus terminal over here, I guess I can just point with my... Oh, no, you guys can't see that. Uh, the bus terminal over here um, is right now completely closed uh, for construction because they're putting in elevators um, and um, it started uh, in 2021 and uh, it's planned to uh, end next year so it's been going on for uh, a year now um, and as a result of this closure we have to um, come up with uh, divergence for routes that are serving that bus terminal. So our routes 83 Dunlands and 56 Leaside aren't able to go inside the terminal now, so they have to serve customers on street and then loop around to be able to uh, go back on their route. So that's um, one of the examples of divergence that we have to make to uh, account for construction. And on the right side, you see um, the table of the easier access projects with all of the remaining um, station constructions and when um, when they're all planned, uh, supposed to finish. And the goal is to make um, our system accessible by 2025. Okay, uh, last but not least, um, planning for future. Um, we know that there are exciting changes coming to our transit system and to our city. Um, and uh, we know that we need to um, start getting ready for them. We already have. Um, and uh, planning for um, these new transit projects and also construction in the city in the next couple of years is going to be a major part of the, the work that our team is um, doing currently and in the, the next couple of years. So this is our system right now. This is a map that I showed earlier to you. So it shows our uh, subway lines and our streetcar lines. And this is what the network is going to look like um, in 2030s. So you see there are a lot of new new lines um, that are um, under construction uh, or planned. Um, one of them is line five, um, Eglinton, which is uh, planned to open next year. Uh, and it's shown um, in orange. The other one shown in silver is line six, Finch West. Uh, which is also planned to open next year. Uh, and we also have the replacement um, of Line 3, um, Scarborough Subway Extension, um, shown in green. Um, we also have the Ontario Line um, and um, the extension of Line 1, um, Young North Subway Extension, going all the way uh, to Richmond Hill. Um, so, Although many of these projects won't be completed before the end of the decade, uh, we need to start thinking about our future transit network now and how we can uh, improve our uh, connections and improve service for customers when everything is in place. Uh, one way uh, of doing that is through long-range planning uh, through our five-year service plan and our annual service plans. Uh, so our five-year service plan is this uh, business plan that identifies the service um, resources and funding that are needed to improve um, transit service. So the first five-year service plan we worked on, um, the TTC worked on, uh, covered 2020 and 2024. Uh, and currently, uh, the TTC is working on a reset, so basically the next five-year service plan. Um, and uh, these uh, five-year service plans are the, the framework um, 
that is used to develop the annual service plans or the ASPs, and these are the documents that are the plans that our team, my team, is responsible for. Um, the ASPs are basically a blueprint uh, for providing transit service in the city of Toronto over, over the next year. So on the uh, slide, you see covers of our uh, past uh, two ASPs, the 2021 ASP and the 2022 annual service plan, which um, I worked on my current position. Um, so um, the map um, on the, the top, the right side of the, the slide, it shows our transit network, our bus network uh, around Line 5, and it's uh, basically uh, planning for when Line 5 opens, uh, how are we going to um, change uh, our bus routes, and that was the focal point of the 2022 ASB, the annual service fund we worked on last year. Uh, we had a couple of planning principles uh, which we used to come up with that network and we're also using the same planning principles to change our uh, bus network around uh, Line 6 Inch West and those planning principles are to provide direct connections between these lines and the intersecting bus routes, uh, to realign or extend bus routes that operate in close proximity to these lines to provide new connections for our customers and also to reduce service duplication along the corridor. So for example, if a bus route is operating on Edmonton right now or on Finch West, when the LRT is opening, uh, we want to reduce that uh, duplication as much as possible. Um, as part of this year's ASV, the 2023 Annual Service Plan, we're also working on area studies. Uh, so we're reviewing our existing transit network in eight geographic areas to determine whether a change or a series of changes are needed uh, to improve service for our customers. Um, we also have construction to, to worry about and to think about. Um, we know that construction in downtown is going to intensify in 2023 with the uh, uh, Ontario line um, construction uh, specifically. Uh, we want to learn from um, our experience this year, from all of our uh, planning and our detours. Uh, we want to talk to our customers and make sure that we're addressing their needs. Uh, we want to seek out best practices uh, by communicating to our partners. And we also want to make sure that we're working with our city partners and uh, metro links um, to, to make sure that we provide the, the best uh, transit service possible. Um, and uh, that is going to be the, the major theme in, um, in our um, annual service plan this year. Another exciting project that we're working on at the TTC is our fleet electrification project. Uh, so we're uh, currently working towards a completely zero emission fleet by 2014. Um, and uh, that is a key component of the City of Toronto's Transform Geo Climate Action Plan, which targets an 80% reduction in local greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. Um, we currently operate 60 battery electric buses um, from uh, three different manufacturers, uh, BYD, New Flyer, and Frotera. Um, and uh, we're testing these buses on different routes uh, to determine what the ranges are, what the challenges are, and what the opportunities are, and how are they different than the, um, the buses that we're used to and the operations that we're used to. Uh, we know that um, this is going to uh, bring major changes to the way we plan for and also schedule our service. Um, and uh, it's going to be important um, to uh, include this in our process to make sure that uh, we address the different requirements of these vehicles, mainly their range. And last but not least, uh, what brings all this process together, um, and one of the inputs that we place a great value upon, is hearing from transit users, uh, public, and you know, also our customers. Um, as part of preparing for the 2023 annual service plan, we've been hosting uh, pop-ups, uh, consultation events, and meetings across the city in areas that are mostly impacted by the changes we're proposing. So we have talked to thousands of customers. We've also talked internally with our operators, our supervisors, because those are the people that are delivering the service. Uh, and we're also um, putting a deliberate effort in uh, consulting with 
uh, demographics, demographics that are current, uh, usually underrepresented in uh, our consulting process, um, and those are our youth. So we have a youth ambassador program uh, where we uh, work with uh, youth between the ages of 18 and 29, um, and uh, basically they take our uh, proposals and our plan, they go to their community, um, and uh, they seek feedback on our proposals. Um, we know that transit is, con uh, is going to continue to play a vital role uh, to keep uh, Toronto moving. Uh, and also functioning over the, uh, the next uh, couple of years. Uh, we will continue to focus on the needs of those who depend on transit the most, um, women, customers with low income and shift workers, uh, and many of our um, initiatives in the coming years. We also recognize that many of us, uh, or many, many people who are not uh, using transit during the pandemic are, not, are now coming back to uh, use our buses, our streetcars, and subway trains. Uh, our future service will focus on the basics, um, crowding and reliability, as we welcome uh, more people on transit. Uh, we want to make sure that we are aware of um, travel patterns um, and uh, changes in our customer needs. Um, as we continue to um, change and evolve our service. Um, so that was uh, my presentation. I also wanted to mention that uh, we're hiring. Um, so there's always opportunities at the TTC uh, in our group and other departments as well, but uh, our team is uh, expanding right now. So we're um, hiring for two planners, two planner positions. One of them is a senior planner, the other one is a junior planner. So if you're interested in knowing more or uh, applying for the, the roles, uh, you can go on our uh, carrier's website um, and you'll see all the descriptions there. Uh, I also know that they, they've been posted on LinkedIn, so if you're on LinkedIn, you can also uh, get more information there. That's it for me. Um, looking forward to your questions. Thanks.